It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker uh, for the meeting tonight. Uh, I'm extremely pleased that everyone who I've asked to, to do these from over a wide range of areas has always uh, agreed to give a Zoom talk to us, so I'm very happy about that. Uh, and it's been great to bring in people, obviously, from a wider range than we would normally get for our monthly meetings, which tend to focus on Ontario archaeology, which is great, but it's not the whole story, I guess, uh, on that. So it's nice to be able to bring in speakers from varied places, some very far afield on a variety of topics, uh, and to get a wide range of attendees, too, beyond our normal uh, chapter members and things like that. In any case, I'm very pleased that our speaker tonight uh, from a different time zone is Dr. Marcel Kornfeld, who's a professor of anthropology at the University of Wyoming in Laramie, and he's agreed to talk to us tonight. Uh, Dr. Kornfeld did his BA at the University of New Mexico, where he was influenced by, among others, Lewis Binford, and one of my heroes, James Judge. I read that in your in acknowledgments of your PhD dissertation on there. Uh, and, and he went on to do his MA at Wyoming on an historical archaeology topic, I think on sheep herder campsites. Wasn't that That's right. Yep. That's right. <laughs> on there, which sounds very interesting, actually. Uh, and his PhD at the University of Massachusetts, where he wrote his thesis under the direction of a well-known archaeologist, Dr. Martin Wolfs. Uh, Marcel is editor of the journal Plains Anthropologist, one of my favorite journals because they feature lots of paleo stuff in it <laughs> on that. He's an associate editor for the reviews of anthropology, handling archaeology issues, uh, and he's particularly focused his research on the earlier human occupations, not exclusively, obviously, if you're studying sheep herder sites too at some point, uh, but he's on the earliest human occupations of the Plains and Rocky Mountains and made many contributions to more general issues related to hunter-gatherer complexity, uh, subsistence practices, uh, rock shelter excavations, and, and so on. Uh, he has extensive research experience, but I know he also, in, in ac formal academic context, but I know he's also done CRM work at many times in projects over the years. Uh, Marcel has written or edited 12 books, uh, at least 12, that's all the ones I could count, but anyway, <laughs> on there, in innumerable papers in everything from current anthropology to archaeometry to the Journal of Field Archaeology and so on. Uh, a notable book, uh, is one that he co-wrote with another one of my archaeological heroes, the late Dr. George Friesen, which is entitled Prehistoric Hunters of the High Plains and Rocky Mountains, a famous book, the text, the textbook on the Plains and Rocky Mountain. Uh, so he literally co-wrote the book on the area. Uh, another one of his well-known co-written uh, books is uh, Hell Gap, the Stratified Paleo-Indian Campsite at the Edge of the Rockies. Uh, and Hell Gap is one of the, lo long been regarded as one of the most important paleo sites ever reported. Uh, it's designated as National Historic Landmark in the USA, and that site, at my request, I must add, is the one I asked him to talk about, is the topic of his presentation tonight. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kornfeld. Uh, so Hell Gap, National Historic Landmark, uh, what we know, uh, what we don't know, and what we should uh, find out. Uh, that's kind of a fancy title. Uh, in reality, I'll just tell you about um, the Hell Gap site. Uh, its history of investigations, um, what some of the results were back in the 60s when the site was first excavated, and then uh, some of the more recent results in the work that, that we've been doing uh, since then. Uh, first of all, uh, it, it's important to say that I'm just a mouthpiece here. Um, the uh, uh, Many people were involved in doing parts of uh, this site, uh, many of my colleagues, um, that analyze different uh, sorts, different uh, um, dif different artifacts or different kinds of analysis on artifacts or the ge ge geology, geomorphology, soils, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if I put this together in any way that uh, makes logical sense, great. Uh, if not, I apologize. But again, I'm just really a mouthpiece of these different uh, parts of research that went on uh, into Hell Gap. The other thing about Hell Gap is that uh, it's important to note the many different funding agencies uh, that have supported the site. So for example, Peabody Museum, American Philosophical Society uh, supported the work in the 1960s of the original uh, uh, investigators of the site, as did the National Geographic Society, although they supported uh, us as well. So they have a longer term uh, support. Uh, Warner Grand Grant Foundation, uh, National Endowment of Humanities, Wyoming Archaeological Foundation, Wyoming Cultural Trust Fund, uh, who we just actually uh, finished a project with. Uh, and uh, the most recent project 
um, that is uh, the um, <clears throat> uh, creating a digital archive of all of the Hellgap material, the records, the notes, the artifacts is in progress right now with support from the Institute of Museums uh, and Library uh, Services. So, and I'm sure other than the, some of the private donors that you see down on the bottom, I, I'm, I'm not sure even I've got all of the agencies there, but I think I did do have at least uh, most of the um, important ones. Now, um, kind of purely by chance, I was uh, uh, surfing around my, <clears throat> my computer the other day. I was looking for some articles and I happened to come across the article. So to make a, a connection to uh, Ontario right now, in 1983, uh, Andrew Stewart wrote an article uh, about, um, well, basically asking, are they, are these hell gap points? And, <clears throat> and, uh, and what is um, his interest in what's the connection? How'd that, how did they get into Ontario? This is from the Xander site uh, in Ontario. If you can, if you can see that. Uh, it was supposed to have the title of his article on top, but uh, like I said, I, it, uh, I failed to save that, I guess. In, in any case, um, these are the points from, from that site that Andrew had uh, uh, argued are, are Hell Gap, and they look good to me. Uh, and I will not only talk about Hell Gap points because the whole point of Hell Gap, uh, pardon the pun, is that, um, is, is that uh, Hell Gap is a stratified site with lots of different um, uh, uh, components uh, in it. So to kind of go back to the, some of the Paleo-Indian studies and where they are and where they've been, I think um, uh, the way I look at it and many others do, the second big question in the history of American archeology, span this is following the resolution of uh, who built uh, the mounds back in the 1800s, was the antiquity of American Indians. Uh, how long have American Indians uh, been on uh, the continent? Uh, first attempts to provide these answers um, uh, were uh, in the early 1900s, late, late 1800s, was a short duration, a short time span, 2000 years, 4,000 years. That was what was favored by most people. And that was folks working in Mexico with the uh, Maya ruins and the Southwest and, and in other kinds of places. Uh, a minority uh, 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 developed the idea of what was at that time known as uh, the American Paleolithic. And these people argued that uh, people have uh, been in the Americas for indeed a long time. Uh, the American Paleolithic was supposed to be something comparative to European Paleolithic. Um, not to go into a, a long story about all of this, that, that sort of idea uh, dropped out uh, very, rather quickly for a variety of reasons, a lack of knowledge of geology being one of them. Um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, but in any case, uh, by 1926 or 27, uh, the antiquity of American Indians was uh, uh, definitely uh, uh, proven uh, to be at the end of the Pleistocene. In other words, they were certainly around at least since the end of the end of the Pleistocene. This is with the discovery down in uh, Folsom, New Mexico. So Folsom marks the initiation of Paleo Indian studies. Uh, it was an accepted uh, age, and and from then on, Paleo Indian studies uh, moved forward. From the Folsom site excavation until the 1960s, the main question was cultural sequence and the duration of Paleo Indian period. So um, uh, when did the uh, Paleo-Indian period start and when do we uh, think the, is the end of Paleo-Indian period? For us in Wyoming, we uh, think that's archaic. Well, most people think it's archaic, although in different parts of North America, uh, there are different archaics and, and somewhat of a different uh, time sequence as to when the archaic actually uh, <clears throat> begins. Well. For a variety of reasons, including a relatively small database of Paleo-Indian sites, we're still kind of stuck into this purely uh, culture historical question. So uh, a Hell Gap site played a big role in that in the 1960s, but it kind of continues uh, to play a role in that. Most sites until well into the 1970s 
uh, with the one exception being Hell Gap and some of the others, and a few, uh, a few others uh, were a large animal procurement sites. Uh, these were single occupations, uh, single diagnostics, uh, artifact, no stratigraphy. So basically what we're used to, the bison kill. Bison kills mainly prior to bison kills, of course, uh, the mammoth kills once the uh, uh, time period of uh, was extended uh, to Clovis as being prior uh, to the Folsom occupation. So most sites excavated in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, were those kinds uh, of sites. There wasn't uh, usually a stratigraphic sequence of Paleo-Indian components. It was one component, uh, one type of uh, projectile point. So the cultural chronology was not well understood. Uh, Marie Wormington um, wrote a series of updated books from the 19, late 1930s into 1950s uh, that attempted to uh, demonstrate what the cultural sequence was during the Paleo-Indian period. In other words, during the period, and Paleo-Indian is not necessarily well-defined, uh, but the one, de uh, the one definition that folks have been uh, using since um, Marie Wormington's definition um, was the association with extinct megafauna. And the one extinct megafauna that continued is bison and tiquis. Um, and it continued into the uh, uh, less than 10,000 years ago, somewhere around, somewhere between eight and 9,000 years ago, there's a change into uh, bison occidentalis. So th that's a way, uh, at least some people define Paleo-Indian period, and I kind of uh, stick with that. In any case, uh, Marie Wormington tried to find these disparate pieces of Paleo-Indian uh, uh, prehistory and put it into chronological uh, order. Hell Gap site is located in uh, uh, east central Wyoming. Uh, it is on the eastern edge of the uh, Hartville uplift right over here. Uh, Haystack Range, one of the easternmost uh, ranges down here in the southeastern part uh, of the Hartville uplift. Uh, an important part of this is that the uplift itself contains a lot of uh, raw material since you folks are talking about flint napping. Uh, this is a flint napper's hev heaven, uh, if you will. Um, Spanish digging quarries up there, it, it really doesn't do justice to what all is available along uh, the Hartville uh, 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 uplift. You know, literally, literally the entire uplift, there are some um, nine different geologic formations that produce a nappable uh, material and that are used. Uh, Spanish digging, some people reserve this just for the fine grain quartzite, but in reality, the um, Carmel colored churches uh, are, are just as um, prevalent in that area as are a number of other raw material sources. And again, over the entire Hartville uplift, some 50, kilometers north-south, 40 kilometers east-west. So that's one thing about the location of Hell Gap. It is uh, in that context of, of the raw material. The other thing is that the edge, uh, if you will look at the, uh, the eastern edge of the Hartville Uplift here, basically you can say you've got the open prairies, uh, grasslands, prairies uh, to the east, and you have sort of a ponderosa pine savanna uh, in the Hartville uplift itself. And even though the uplift, geologic uplift, is um, the geologic formation stops over here at the um, uh, North Platte River, uh, the Hartville itself is in a, in a way tied into uh, the, the first chain of the Rocky Mountains, which is just to the east of that. In other words, it just starts to go, uh, the, the topography goes up from there and, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, so it's kind of a, like this little, uh, almost like a peninsula that sticks out uh, into the uh, open plains. The site was first excavated in the 1960s by the Peabody Museum. Uh, Cynthia and Henry Irwin were the lead uh, excavators. Um, uh, John O'Brew was their, uh, their professor at, at Peabody. Uh, Vance Haynes um, uh, was, this was, uh, well, this was supposed to be actually his dissertation until he went over to Thule Springs 
uh, and that didn't quite pan out the way it was supposed to for him, but I think he got him his dissertation, it's just that it turned out not to be an archaeological site, which is probably what um, turned him into questioning uh, uh, the, the pre-Clovis material. Um, the 1960s excavation uh, found uh, five localities, four of them were Paleo-Indian, they're labeled here as one, two, three, and three south, or five, um, uh, or, so that, those are the main localities along this, about a kilometer and a half long creek that sort of winds up like this by locality one, and then winds down to the south and then back up to the north by locality two uh, and near localities three uh, and four. A locality one is the one that has really the most uh, stratigraphy uh, with it. In terms of the, uh, at least uh, the, the plains, uh, plains area, plains Rocky Mountain chronology, what we're talking about is this period down here between Goshen uh, and, and Lusk and uh, uh, basically some uh, early Paleo-Indian middle and late Paleo-Indian components. All of these components here, except for uh, Clovis, were actually identified in the sequence that you see uh, over here in this, uh, in this time chart of the uh, Plains area. The 1960s excavation left us quite a bit of material and that was the uh, initial goal of our work at the Hell Gap site was to publish it uh, because there was uh, no uh, publications other than Henry Irwin's dissertation, which was uh, from Harvard University and generally those dissertations are difficult to get. Um, on one of the following slides, I have a couple of other uh, papers that were um, published on it. But in any case, uh, Hell Gap has uh, uh, 22 volumes of notes. And when I mean notes, I'm looking at down the lower left. Uh, these are level notes of about every two inches pretty much throughout for all of the excavation areas uh, that they did. Uh, Henry Irwin, um, uh, patched some of these together into more of what he thought were floor maps. And there are several thousand slides that go along with it. I point this out because it comes in contrast with the way a lot of archeology span was done at the time. Willow Spring site, which I'm sure none of you ever heard of because it hasn't even been published. Uh, I kind of got interested in thinking I, was, I may publish it and I may do something with it. Uh, was excavated by Bill Malloy at about the same time uh, as Hell Gap. And all that there is for this site is these cards on the upper left. I actually had to put these cards together so I could actually make a map of what was excavated at the site. So very, very different and uh, perhaps legitimate in terms of uh, what was important. Uh, but um, that's just uh, to show you how variety uh, 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 of records can, can exist for, for different kinds of sites. Some of the results of the 1960s uh, excavations is uh, the excavations uh, demonstrated some of the earliest known Paleo-Indian structures. At the time, uh, I'm not sure whether these were the first or whether there were some Paleo-Indian sites. I think maybe, um, oh, I think the, um, the site in Boston doesn't, I can't remember the name right now, um, that had some structures, or at least people were arguing that there were structures. I think people are still arguing whether those, uh, those were structures. Um, uh, and uh, there was two varieties. One was stone circles that you see over here, maybe some of the earliest teepees. Uh, and then there was also uh, several post molds of the early Paleo-Indian period, Midland, uh, Agate Basin. And here you see three post holes, uh, three, three, excuse me, four sets of post holes, which would have probably been some kind of lean-tos like uh, what you see over here. Uh, and by the way, since I'm talking to Canadians, um, uh, uh, Bill, uh, Bill, Bill Moreland is responsible for these uh, pencils that each, which, each one of uh, which uh, actually points uh, 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 to a post hole. Uh, so when they took the photograph, uh, they could 
uh, I'm, I'm sure you don't see the post holes very well on them, but you see it on the on the pro on the uh, map. Uh, other results, uh, significant results of the 1960s were um, were beads. Again, these were some of the earliest discoveries of Paleo Indian beads. Uh, recently, I say recently, but maybe as much as 10 years ago now, uh, <clears throat> there was an article on Paleo Indian beads across the country, and apparently, 140 beads are known from Paleo Indian sites altogether. Uh, put that together with the fact that, like Arch Lake Women's site in Texas. There are some 20 or 30 of them there, a few other sites that have multiple beads. The three sites discovered, uh, uh, beads discovered at Hell Gap are a significant addition to this entire um, uh, uh, inventory of Paleo Indian beads. The bead on the left uh, is from the Frederick uh, uh, level, uh, and it's an incised bone bead. The other two are from the uh, Agate Basin level, and uh, this one is. Uh, um, a hematite bead, uh, and this is uh, some sandstone uh, type uh, material. Uh, in terms of ubiquitous artifacts and rare artifacts that were recovered in the 60s, uh, bone is certainly uh, was quite ubiquitous, even though Hell Gap is not a kill site. It did have copious quantities of bones in some levels quite a bit. Uh, so there was very definitely some major processing of bone that was going on there. Uh, and uh, about 90% of the bone at Hell Gap is bison, about 10% is deer or prong, uh, pronghorn. And there are a few bones, needles, and awls. And this is a rare artifact. In fact, you see just about all of them uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the right there, on the upper right uh, of the um, uh, screen. Again, in terms of Paleo Indian needles, a recent article, uh, 90 Paleo Indian needles across North America. Um, one of these is at Hell Gap. We actually have several more that we have found in the last uh, few years of needle fragments, I should say. Uh, the 60s bone needle was uh, fairly complete. It did not have the tip uh, and now is unfortunately missing a good part of the eye, but. Uh, but it, and nevertheless, it is recorded uh, at the site. Uh, ubiquitous artifacts are chipstone tools, 3,000, over 3,000, actually close to 4,000 that Henry Irwin uh, divided up into 40 different artifact classes. And Henry Irwin used uh, the Bordian typology uh, to do this. So you get those kinds of upper paleolithic, uh, middle paleolithic, actually, he used middle paleolithic, I believe. Uh, you get those uh, uh, European artifact classes that he identified it uh, as in his dissertation. There are tens of thousands of pieces of debitage from uh, 1960s groundstone uh, and uh, oak, some groundstone and ochre. So these are obviously very uh, rare contributions uh, to Paleo-Indian prehistory. The key result of the 1960s excavations, of course, is the chronology. And on the left is uh, the, uh, the end, uh, pretty much the end of the excavations uh, by Cynthia Henry Irwin and their colleagues, uh, showing uh, the, the, the cultural components from top to bottom and in the stratigraphic uh, sediments that they're in. So you have Goshen, Folsom, Midland, uh, Agate Basin, Hell Gap, Alberta, Eden, Scuds Bluff, uh, and Frederick. Uh, it's important to note that we're basically talking less than a meter and a half of sediment that all of these uh, occur in. And then to put on top of that, uh, the Hell Gap in Alberta, you can see they're separated by, by, by quite a bit, lots of, uh, lots of dirt in between. And it doesn't, doesn't mean that Hell Gap is right there smack in the middle. It's probably throughout that area. But, but the point being that Hell Gap in Alberta seem to take a almost half a chunk of that stratigraphy, which tells you that uh, Goshen, Folsom, Midland, all of these others are really separated by very, very little, maybe 10 to 15, sometimes 20 centimeters. Uh, and uh, given that uh, um, the surface of the earth is not necessarily flat, these are very actually thin, thin levels, but they are uh, superimposed in one of each other. And this perhaps becomes a problem a little bit later uh, in my story here. Um, 
so uh, uh, Hell Gap became the key in reconstruction of uh, Paleo-Indian prehistory. Uh, Henry Irwin, in his dissertation, um, called everything after the Clovis culture, the Itama culture, and subdivided these into a number of phases, uh, Plainview, Lindenmeyer, uh, Sisters Hill, uh, and Horner uh, over, you can see it on the left-hand side uh, in kind of that second column. Uh, but the point here being that you had all those sites that were known in the 1960s when Irwin was writing his, uh, his works. Um, and they represent perhaps uh, uh, one of those phases uh, or so, or two or three of the phases. Hell Gap represented the entire sequence, uh, sub post Folsom sequence, uh, from, from the Plainview phase all the way up to uh, the Lusk phase. Um, now there is a, a discussion that I won't go into about uh, plain view because uh, plain view and Goshen, some see this as the same uh, type of a thing, uh, same type of a, a, a diagnostic artifact. Others see it as different types, but that's that's a discussion that will continue for some time. Uh, 1960s, the raw results of the 1960s were that there was a broad variety of tools at Hell Gap. Uh, known and previously unrecognized projectile points in the stratigraphy. I didn't point that out when I showed the points, but uh, Goshen, uh, Hell Gap, uh, and uh, Frederick were new varieties uh, that were recognized. So Hell Gap is a type site for three of those. There's some ground stone and hammer stones, structures, uh, needles, awls, beads, ochre. Again, mostly bison bone, except for the late this Paleo-Indian period, the Frederick complex of roughly around 8,000 years ago, where we see uh, a lot of uh, deer and antelope. Uh, and uh, the, the turtle and wolf tax, actually, that's wrong. That's not from the 1960s. Uh, those are recent discoveries. In terms of interpretation of the results, uh, uh, Irwin Williams et al., 1973, one of the few articles on this. Uh, uh, the, the, the main most important thing was the Paleo-Indian chronological sequence or the suggestion of diagnostic artifacts, pretty much as Marie Wormington had reconstructed uh, from uh, various, uh, 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 in various other ways, but without the demonstration. So for Erwin Williams and them, this was a demonstration of uh, uh, Marie Wormington's uh, chronology that she had constructed um, using uh, various uh, archaeological methods. Uh, um, Hell Gap is a campsite, uh, and uh, most components are relatively long duration. And Hell Gap, uh, the Hell Gap component, however, was seen as a short duration hunting camp. So we have these superimposed uh, components, and they're relatively long duration uh, camps. Bison was a main source of subsistence, except again in the Frederick or late Paleo-Indian components where medium, medium mammals uh, come in. And of course, this is sort of a beginning of thinking about going from Paleo-Indian into the archaic where, um, uh, where uh, a more diverse subsistence um, becomes, um, uh, becomes part of the uh, lifeways. Uh, Hell Gap has been important since the 1960s. The 1966 Inqua Congress, uh, which was in Denver, uh, took a field trip in 1966, right towards the end of the excavations to the Hell Gap site, with Cynthia down there on the bottom, actually for giving a tour of the work. Uh, some of the visitors to the site, actually John, John O. Brew from Peabody was, uh, was, uh, was a co-PI, and, uh, and uh, 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 Cynthia and Henry, Henry Irwin's professor, Lou Binford visited, Richard Moreland was at the site, Richard Taylor, um, the, the, the radiocarbon person from uh, uh, Irvine, uh, Mary Wormington, Dennis Stanford, Eileen Johnson, and many, many others. And if you look at actually the roster of excavators in the 60s and some since the 90s, uh, it's a virtual who's who in, uh, uh, in American archeology, span lots of people, that went into various different fields uh, in uh, uh, my archaeology and to others were actually got their start uh, at, at Hell Gap. 
um, for six years that uh, they excavated under some of those uh, uh, grants that I mentioned, there was 40 or more people each year. So several hundred people uh, in the 60s. And then we've had uh, that many more since then. It's a key site and it remains a key site for over 50 years. In 1966, Gordon Willey uh, had Hell Gap uh, under his uh, big game hunters in one of the first uh, uh, culture chronologies um, uh, synthesis of North America. Brian Fagan in 2013 uh, features the site quite a bit in his The First North Americans volume and in several other volumes uh, where he uh, covers uh, North America. And I believe there may be some mention of it in more recent North American prehistory overviews. Uh, as I said earlier, um, there's very little published. Uh, Henry Irwin in 68, his dissertation, Irwin Williams, 73, uh, Vance Haynes had a number of publications um, that uh, deal with a geochronology and uh, a geology of Hell Gap and plain, more, more generally plains, et cetera. Uh, and selected publications with the use of Hell Gap, such as Irwin and Wormington's 1970 American Antiquity article and Irwin in 72. Uh, this, is, this all brought us, um, this, uh, th th this is how we started the, the investigations of the Hell Gap site. It was trying to uh, pub fully publish uh, Hell Gap. Uh, and Chris Ellis mentioned uh, the Hell Gap vo volume that we did publish as a result of the work. However, that is still not that is still very far from a full publication because the site is way too big for all of us, I'm afraid. Uh, in any case, we did uh, then start going back uh, to the field uh, after sort of summarizing those 1960s materials. And for one thing that you can see here, for example, is a schematic diagram of uh, uh, the geology uh, of Hell Gap, the one in the yellow on the right is from the 1960s with a little more than half a dozen radiocarbon dates. And the one on the left is after our uh, continued investigation that started in uh, 1992. So a number of things you don't see here, for example, is this is stratigraphic unit E, which is where most of Paleo-Indian material is. The valley itself was scoured down to this unit prior to uh, uh, late, uh, late Pleistocene, and then Unit E started depositing. There are five different uh, 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 subunits within E and several different with Unit F. These are the Paleo-Indian components of Hell Gap. Um, we have a much broader range of dates, chronological sequence of dates, even though there are definitely dates that are out of sequence. Uh, and uh, if somebody can tell me how, we can avoid doing that in any site, I would be very happy. But the reality is that when you get a bunch of dates, some of them are not in the order that you want them to be. Um, but the, we did uh, since uh, we, uh, a, a big addition since the 60s was actually a demonstration of the later sediments that are in the Hell Gap Valley that continue up until recently, up until 200 years ago. We have dates of 6,000, 3,000, 1,700, 200 uh, uh, years ago. So, uh, so the sedimentation processes of a valley are much, much better understood now than they were after the 1960s uh, excavation, although our focus and previous people's focus was Paleo-Indian time. Uh, surface geology uh, also tells us throughout the valley that I was just showing you, here's the Hell Gap Creek, locality one, locality two, locality three and five. And you can see in the dark brown here is where uh, the Paleo-Indian age uh, sediments are. Actually F over here uh, is late Paleo-Indian and then all of these. Uh, so uh, the point being that the excavations um, of the uh, 1960s only covered very, very small portions of what there is still available in terms of uh, Paleo-Indian sediments. Uh, uh, how, much, uh, how many of those sediments still have archaeology in them? That's another question. But for example, here in locality two on the west side of the creek, uh, there is very definitely some Paleo-Indian sediments because we tested there. Many of these others have not uh, been tested. Uh, in terms of data reanalysis, 
uh, from the uh, old bones that we did. Um, uh, as I said, uh, uh, Hell Gap is in contrast to the be better known uh, bison kills, and it is a camp. Uh, at kills, we you often get high utility use, um, uh, use, for example, what's sometimes known as gourmet butchery. In other words, they take the hump meat and they go away. Uh, that's maybe a little simplified, but something like that. Uh, at camp, you see a lot of processing, processing and marrow extraction. So metatarsals and radii over here from the Hell Gap site, you can see they've all been processed uh, and marrow has been removed from them. We don't yet see in Paleo-Indian period, to my knowledge, really heavy pro processing, such as you see uh, at, let's say, Head Smashed In where they are pulverizing the ends uh, uh, of bones and, and making bone grease kind of stuff. But we do see, uh, we do see marrow extraction. And uh, in terms of the bones that are present, the graph down here on the right, the most common bones are the ones that have uh, the best um, uh, uh, fat content uh, in, the, in the internal cavities. Their analysis, uh, the reanalysis also showed that butchering and, butch and, and meat cutting uh, was a significant portion of the activity, uh, probably most of the tools that were analyzed and still very few. Um, this was a small project that only analyzed a, a sample, uh, but a lot of meat cutting in that. However, we do say, see skinning and, and tanning activity, uh, bone grooving, as well as uh, wood uh, whittling. So all of these things are going on uh, <clears throat> at the Hell Gap site, as one would expect uh, in a campsite. They're making lots of different things. They're making things from the bone. They're making things from uh, the wood, uh, etc. The uh, Paleo-Indian sequence was somewhat put into jeopardy by uh, Frederic Soleil, uh, who uh, Rihanna, who was one of the earlier earliest uh, reanalysts uh, of the. Uh, 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 archaeological record worked with us uh, in the early 1990s. And on the basis of um, certain problems with, uh, with datums, um, uh, based on some reanalysis, uh, typological reanalysis, Fred argued that we do not have a clean uh, sequence such as was presented in that profile that I showed you, but indeed that the things are a bit more messy. So uh, in different parts of the site, he saw different things. But if you just look at this um, a thing on the bottom, which is showing you the different uh, frequencies of artifacts in, in about two centimeter levels, uh, he argues that this, uh, and I can't get my mouse to work. There it is. Uh, in, uh, this uh, very bottom uh, dense artifact concentration is, contains both Folsom and Goshen artifacts. Next one up, Agate Basin Folsom then an unknown, then again, Folsom and Goshen. Again, he did this on the basis of evaluating the site notes and re-typologizing uh, the points. This may or may not be correct, but it does put uh, a question whether, um, well, it gives us a reason to go back to Hell Gap uh, and, and excavate some more and figure out what's going on. And that's what we've been doing since uh, 1999, actually since before 1999. Um, uh, okay, so um, in 1993, we went back to Hell Gap. Uh, chronology was uh, one of our questions, but things about site structure and formation were others. Uh, questions about, is there bias in the data? How did they collect the data? Uh, what are we missing? Uh, and subsistence. Uh, and mobility uh, were some of the things that sort of directed our, uh, our project. Uh, we've been running biennial field schools and actually annual field schools because uh, I re we, um, uh, we realized that uh, uh, we would be retiring soon. And if we didn't start running uh, projects out there annually, uh, yeah, this would never get done. And I'm happy to say that one or two seasons, I think, will be there. Um, some of the recent discoveries are a series of chipped stone um, uh, uh, production areas. 
Um, this is not new. They found these in the 1960s, but they did not document them as well as we would wish them to be documented. And uh, what you see in these three piles here, the one on the lower right, you don't see that very well, but I'll tell you what it is. Um, on the left, you can see that we're, we're, we're dealing with some early stages of production. They're big flakes, um, maybe hammerstone or whatever, but the thing is they're big flakes. They're just taking flakes off of the core. They're producing large flakes to do something else with them. On the upper right, you see flakes that are more within a maybe two, three centimeters range uh, or so. So later stages of production in that area. And on the bottom, uh, it's very hard to actually see the flakes in kind of this, uh, uh, this, 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 this uh, a, a, um, uh, thing, uh, a pedestal right over here, but these are all tiny flakes. These are all tiny. They're, they're probably, they're centimeter or, or, or less. So, uh, and these are, these areas are very much separated from each other. In fact, they might even be uh, of, of different uh, time periods. Um, so um, uh, this has not yet been fully analyzed to actually say, well, this is what's going on with this pile versus this pile, but we can tell that they're very different stages of stone tool production. Uh, we also recovered almost all of the diagnostic artifacts uh, from the 1960s. We do not have a, uh, a Goshen point yet, uh, but we think we do have a Goshen level. So Folsom, uh, Agate Basin, Hell Gap, Alberta, Scott's Bluff, uh, and Frederick, all of these recovered in the 1960s in where we expected to find them as per uh, the stratigraphic column that they showed us. Now, here are two Folsom points in this very high artifact frequency in stratigraphic unit E2, these two stars on the bottom. Note that in E1, there is a, uh, uh, a peak in the artifacts. We suspect this peak is the Goshen component but we do not have a point there to actually say, yep, that's where the Goshen points are coming from. And I'm afraid we probably will not. Nevertheless, the rest of this, uh, <clears throat> the rest of this chronology is pretty well uh, demonstrated and we're pretty uh, happy with that. Now, I apologize for showing this uh, graph because you probably can't see it. I know you can't see it. If it was on the big screen and you were all close, maybe you would. But I just want to show you kind of the enormity, uh, how big the site is. We're looking at 30 meters uh, from the left over here to the right over here. And it's a back plot of artifacts against the back wall uh, of the site. So you are seeing, especially in this area, and I have another close up uh, of this, then that's important. What you see down here is a uh, Goshen. Folsom and Agate Basin levels that are very much lumped together, uh, very close and very close proximity. And there's so much stuff with them that it's very hard to separate them actually uh, into individual components in this place. Uh, and above that, uh, above that, you see a, a, a hell gap level fairly well with lots of things scattered around, uh, then getting into... Um, uh, Alberta, Eden, Scotts Bluff, uh, and, and Frederick. And some of the uh, uh, um, diagnostic artifacts are labeled here. So here, for example, is a uh, Hell Gap artifact right here, uh, Scotts Bluff artifacts right here, and that Scotts Bluff component. And this is a more recent excavation area. You can uh, fairly well see two components, one here and one here. Uh, and there are two I get basin projectile points here, and there are several diagnostic Folsom artifacts uh, in this one. And again, there is another, there's actually another bone level below that with very little lithics, but there's a bone level below that that we suspect is, uh, is Goshen. Oh, just tried graphic correlation between the 1960s and today. This is the same profile. Uh, actually at 90 degrees to each other. So here is the 60s profile with Goshen, Folsom, et cetera. Uh, and here's a profile as we uh, excavated it, seeing kind of the same paleo soles in a several locations uh, that, 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 carry, that carry on. So we were able to actually say, ah, here we are. 
we are right in their upper Frederick level. We're right in their Alberta level and so on and so forth. Um, uh, some of you may have seen this uh, age depth model that uh, one of our former students, now the state archeologist of Wyoming did, uh, where he uh, identified these different uh, modes uh, of occupation uh, of the site and try to get a better sense of the time frame. Uh, we're still working on this. This was a uh, this was a concept paper that he did, uh, but now we also have a series of OSL ages for that same area. With 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 radiocarbon dates, you can't necessarily stack them up because they don't come one above each other. You have to kind of go across that whole profile and pick a date and say, oh, that date is 10 centimeter into this stratum. That date over there is 10 centimeters above this stratum. So they're in this, uh, in this stratigraphic position relative to each other. With OSL ages, they're all actually in a column together. It turns out that, uh, the, that I, I guess I should say we did it right. Uh, because it pretty much corresponds to these series of OSL uh, ages. This is still a, a, a project in the making, if you will, using this optical simulated uh, luminescence ages uh, uh, for Hell Gap. Um, and there'll be more coming out on this in the next several years. I don't have anything about microbes. Here's a more detailed uh, backplot profile of that center section of Hell Gap. A couple of things I want to point out. It's what's known uh, as a series of units in front of the witness block. And the back plot is actually of like a meter and a half. So it's, uh, it's fairly clean uh, and, uh, and clear. Uh, again, uh, you can see that there's a lot of bone, the yellow uh, here in the Frederick level. And right below that, uh, the Eden Scotts Bluff level. I mean, they're like right on top of each other in this area of the site. In other areas of the site, they may be further separated. Also, the red is ochre. There, there is a little uh, concentration of ochre here for some reason. This concentration of ochre, I will talk a lot more about. Uh, it is down in the Folsom level, and it's associated with, uh, fl uh, with fluting Folsom points. Uh, and that ochre level also extends clear across for about five, six uh, meters. Um, so, um, one way we're interpreting this uh, at present is that uh, we think the Hell Gap site, uh, probably the, um, the long duration occupations, there may be some of those, uh, but a lot of the Hell Gap site, I think, is uh, uh, a series of very short duration occupations maybe a, a few weeks, a few days by a few people, and then, it's, uh, then they leave, then they come back uh, again and again and again. Um, 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 okay. Um, this is this uh, series of Eastern units, and uh, 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 we have actually more excavated now. I just don't have a map of it. And you can see the black is a, Chipstone concentration, a couple of other chipstone concentrations here. They're at different levels. Uh, this one over here is in the Folsom level. Uh, the, the, the red that you see in there is um, uh, uh, ochre again. It's a pretty good size ochre concentration, but it is in the overlying uh, uh, layer. It's in the Hell Gap layer. On the other hand, this ochre concentration actually is in the Folsom level. So it's a complicated site. Oh, th and this sort of shows you what I'm talking about. So here's some ochre. Here's three levels. One level up here, uh, one level over here, and one level down here on the bottom, the purple, which is largely bone, except for this concentration of uh, chipped stone. Now, it's a little bit harder. There's something going on here. It's not an erosional area, but it's an area that is empty of uh, artifacts. So this uh, agate basin, um, I'm sorry, this is a back plot, okay? Uh, so this agate basin component continues over here. This uh, Folsom component continues here, and you can see that large ochre concentration on this uh, side of it, 
Um, some of the recent archaeological recoveries include turtle, wolf, split phalanges. So they're really going after marrow from uh, very small uh, critters. Uh, Folsom, Folsom artifacts, this uh, Folsom aged blade core, fairly unusual find. Uh, Folsom uh, 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 preform tip and a Folsom preform and another Folsom tool with quite a bit of use wear on it. Um, ochre, um, this, and when I'm done, Chris can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but to best of my knowledge, this is a piece of hematite, probably from a nearby Powers 2 site that you might have uh, been hearing a lot about. It's an ochre mine, Clovis Age ochre mine. Uh, this is a piece of uh, 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 hematite that is fat, has numerous facets on it, lots of scratches, and it's sitting right next to this um, uh, granite pallet. This is another granite pallet that has been clearly shaped with an ochre sphere sitting uh, on top of it. it. My preliminary search of the literature suggests that this is probably the largest piece of hematite uh, in a Paleo Indian assemblage that I know about. Um, uh, some of the other new discoveries uh, Folsom Ultra Thins uh, right over here with some diving flakes. Um, and uh, this is probably um, uh, a unique find. Again, I already mentioned wolf, turtle. The thing is that this wolf and turtle are in the context of that ochre concentration on the southwest side of the witness block, along with uh, about eight Folsom Channel Flakes, two preforms, a mammoth ivory um, object that has obviously been uh, worked, including some ochre put uh, placed into a hole on the other side of the object and uh, some ochre pieces and um, uh, um, a, gr a grinding stone. I can't emphasize how unique this is. We know that there is Folsom material at Hell Gap. These are the only Folsom channel flakes recovered at Hell Gap. And they all come from an area of less than one by one meter in the context of ochre, wolf, turtle, uh, mammoth, uh, mammoth tusk, um, and mammoth tusk. Now there's a big discussion in uh, Paleo-Indian archeology span about why Folsom people fluted their things. And uh, um, uh, our former colleague, uh, now deceased, Stanley Ayler, had this uh, model of Folsom points being hafted. And as they're getting used up, pushing, being pushed further and further and further uh, out. Um, and for him, the fluting was a functional uh, 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 feature that enhanced this kind of process. Well, I'm sorry, folks, when it comes to Hell Gap and that little Folsom fluting feature, I can't, I'm not very ritually oriented, but I can't get away from thinking that that's ritual staring us in the face. Um, so that's my interpretation of that feature and uh, you will be hearing more about that feature in the future. Right now, it's kind of buried among all of our other Hell Gap stuff. Um, a recent recovery of a piece of obsidian. Now, there's virtually no obsidian in Hell Gap. Uh, there, is, um, there is a little bit of Knife River Friend, few pieces. Uh, there was supposed to be a piece of alabates in the 1960s, but it is apparently no longer in the collection. The Alberta level, uh, the Alberta component from locality one is linked to Bridger Formation Church in this area. This piece uh, was just a uh, few months ago, uh, actually sourced by XRF uh, to the Grinner, well, uh, to Phillips Pass source, which is Southern Teton range. But Phillips pa Pass source is available in nodules about this size. This is cortex around this little piece, three centimeters long. Um, 
uh, is available in uh, uh, a pebble form throughout the upper Green River Basin. So I suspect this is from uh, the Green River Basin. And are, in other words, uh, there is a connection, uh, another connection of Hell Gap uh, from the Agate Basin component, in, in fact, uh, to this area uh, of, uh, I guess, gets pretty close to the Great Basin there, if you will. Certainly, certainly Western Rocky Mountains. Now, Paleo Indian cultural sequence. Here is a conundrum that I see, and conundrum that I see on the basis of Hell Gap. And that's this. We have a nice Hell Gap sequence. You've seen the dates from around um, uh, 11,000 down here to about 8,000 down here. But we continually see Paleo Indian archaeologists give us dates of whatever, um, uh, uh, Cody components or Agate Basin components or whatever, Folsom components. And they show us a whole series of dates. And, you know, as in the case of uh, this uh, Cody uh, series of dates published in uh, Nellan Muniz's book on Cody from 7,500 uncorrected years ago to 10,500 uncorrected years ago. There's slight exaggeration on my part here. They throw out these, these, these uh, very limited dates. But nevertheless, there's a whole series of dates in between here that they present as being uh, a Cody date. Why is this a problem? It's a problem because every time you see a stratified site, and there are more now than just Hell Gap, is 7,500 years ago, would be up here at Hell Gap. 10,500 years ago would be down here at Hell Gap in the Folsom. And yet the Cody material doesn't occur up here, doesn't occur down here, but it occurs right here in the Cody levels. So stratified sites have something to tell us um, about radiocarbon dating. I mean, I don't wanna say radiocarbon dating is, doesn't work. Of course it does work. We all rely on it, uh, but there is more that we need to learn about radiocarbon dates. And, uh, and I think that's uh, uh, the end of my uh, story. Uh, as Chris says, uh, Hell Gap is, uh, still holds the key. Uh, and uh, as Chris said, it was enrolled as a National Historic Landmark uh, in uh, 2017. Uh, and uh, with the help of a lot of uh, people, mainly local uh, archeologists. Uh, so thank you. I 